It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here's WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is the Secretary of the Maryland Higher Education Commission, Dr. James Fielder, as well as Stephanie Sutherland. She's the Associate Director for the Maryland Higher Education Commission's Office of Student Financial Assistance. Thank you both for joining me. Good morning, Donna. Good, Good morning. morning to be here. All right. So um, Maryland Higher Education Commission. I know a lot of things about what goes on in Maryland. I have a 16-year-old getting ready to go off to college. I think this is an important uh, organization. Can you explain, Dr. Fielder, what exactly the commission does? Well, great. Well, first, by the excitement on your face when you said the 16-year-old getting ready to go to college, (laughs) that's what we deal with every day. Uh, Hundreds of thousands of students in two-year, four-year public, private, as well as private career schools, religious schools, and other related institutions. What we deal with is the academic program review and approval. We fund a budget of over a half a billion dollars, community college funding, scholarship funding is over $110 million, tax credit funding. So it's a very broad, broad um, group. It's created in 1988 through legislation that had to do with creating a agency for the first time in the state that would deal with efficiencies and hopefully prevent academic duplication so that we create a more efficient and effective higher education system with the goal of providing as much access as possible to the broadest range of academic programs. Okay, layman's terms, you're the organization I need to know about to find the money that my kid will probably need. Yes, and we need the students right up front to be assertive individually assertive for themselves and not rely just on parents and counselors and other people to do so the So don't jobs. be a helicopter mom. Well, you can be a helicopter and hover all you want, but the bottom line is the person on the ground needs to be engaged. Okay. When looking at financial aid, when considering financial aid, how do we ensure, how do the kids ensure that they're not going to be in debt for the rest of their lives? Oh boy, is that an important issue. Um, I mean, there's many different things to approach it. The easiest way to say that the parents, um, over 20 years ago, I think it was 1995 or six, the college program was created, which has now been changed to a different name, but it has to do with allowing parents to start to save money, grandparents, aunts, uncles, for the child when they reach the age of of freshman age. Mm -hmm. So there's that program to set aside money that's, I believe, tax-free, and we'll have to check that. But the bottom line is, in addition to that, there are all kinds of programs, 16 different scholarship programs. Everything's transparent. Everything's on websites. Everything is text out, emailed once the student fills out a FAFSA. So when they reach a certain age, they have to go in to apply for a federal application, free student assistance. I said it before. <laughs> but it, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Stephanie, what is it? It's actually the free application for federal student aid. Um, it's a, a federal form. It's an application, a universal application that students can complete in order to be considered for financial aid at whatever institution they choose. So I kid you not, yesterday my daughter said I was on the FAFSA website, and then mm-hmm. I said, what's FAFSA? So, yeah. I mean, timely interview. Yes. Thank it, you for It's this. very timely, yeah. and that's the only reason we showed up today, because we saw FAFSAs outside in the bushes, and we know that people don't. <laughs> understand what they are but, but the bottom line is it's something that really triggers the entry of that student into a system that tracks income it gets into parental um, or those that support them in terms of tax income that's what's used to evaluate the need this is different than the merit okay so the FAFSA is about need so for those students that and parents that have less than 150% of federal poverty line income, that triggers different amounts and different scholarships that are available, including almost full ride scholarships Hmm. that are based on need. And of course, there has to be some academic merit and rigor there, but at the same time, a lot of people don't use it. Um, I think 40% of those students that start to fill out the application don't complete. Wow. Which is unbelievable. Yeah, it is. When you're talking about the the amount of money, it can be up to $36,000 per year if it's matched by the independent colleges, which two years ago, working with uh, Governor Hogan, we established a new program that 
that allows the independents to match. So that's like Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. It's the top institutions. Uh, and, and we're talking, when your, your commission doesn't just deal with undergrad, you also deal with graduate level. Mm -hmm. Stephanie? Yes, yeah, so there are a number of um, financial aid programs available to assist graduate students in their pursuit of their degrees. Um, it really does range. We have um, students that are um, studying in fields that are considered to be shortage areas that are graduate students, such as nurses and um, students um, studying human services and things like that, that we have programs for and then we have other programs that um, you know award um, students funding across disciplines um, such as legislative scholarships that many of our legislators will award our graduate students within their um, districts how does a student contact you how do they start the process just. Uh, well, the first the first step, as um, Dr. Fielder um, mentioned, is to just do the FAFSA because mm -hmm. our department within MHEC, of course, um, we are the Office of Student Financial Assistance. We pull in that FAFSA information, okay. um, particularly for our Maryland residents, so that we can consider them for Maryland state aid. Okay. Because there's so many of our programs that all students need to do is complete the FAFSA, and at that point, and then it's pushed out onto you, and you look and at then, it and say, okay. Okay, this person will you know, be, and okay. when you talk about mm -hmm. pushed out or pulled in this is all through an automated computerized system mm -hmm. and as soon as the student does that they are assigned a specific unique number within our MD caps program all right very good we're going to take a short break when we come back more about the Maryland Higher Education Commission on the 1430 connection we will be right back Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is Secretary of the Maryland Higher Education Commission, Dr. James Fielder, as well as Stephanie Sutherland. She's the Associate Director for the Maryland Higher Education Commission Office of Student Financial Assistance. Uh, there is a lot of debt uh, associated with college. And you're looking at several states, including Maryland, that are trying to do something about that, and the federal government as well. College debt, according to uh, paperwork that your uh, your PIO has given me, says is now estimated at 1.48 trillion dollars nationwide. The average debt in Maryland is 27,455 dollars per student. Governor Hogan has had some initiatives in recent history, yes? Governor Hogan has made higher education a top priority even before he became governor. He understands that this is one of the things that can transform a person's life. The ability as an individual to follow your dream, get the education and change not only your income, but your family's income and create a different legacy for your family. So the issue of college affordability tied to student debt, We've just finished a four-year plan that the, the overall goal, the top, if you want to say a slogan, would be increase student success with less debt. And the last several decades, accessibility has been the major issue. So accessibility has been broadened, but at the same time, the completion was not as strong as it should have been. So we had a lot of students come in, but then because of interruptions for either financial, family, or whatever, they drop out of college. And right. those that drop out after they've started and incurred student debt, have student debt, but no degree. Mm -hmm. So it's a double burden for right. them. So in our plan, the three strategies under there are accessibility, completion, success, and innovation. So what we're looking at is using innovative solutions to come to help the students with uh, student debt. Such as the community college? Uh, well, the community college promise is one that was passed last year. It, uh, appropriated $15 million to be funded started next fiscal year for students to be able to go to the first two years of community college for free. Uh, they have to maintain a 2.3 GPA as well as stay full time. Um, the governor announced just within the last six weeks a new program that he would intend to introduce as a first start of January in the new legislative session. So it'll be a proposal, or it is a proposal now, but to extend that to four-year institutions mm -hmm. so that students would be able to 
be rigorous scholastically, stay in a two-year, finish the two-year associate's degree, and then move to a four-year. But in addition to that, we have taken the steps, we being Maryland Higher Education Commission, working with the Maryland Department of Education, MSDE, as well as working with Department of Labor Licensing Regulation and Department of Commerce to emphasize increased internships, apprenticeships, two plus two programs. The two plus two program is very similar to dual enrollment, meaning that a sophomore in high school enters an academic program starting their junior year. By the time they finish their four year um, high school degree, they also have an associate's degree. And that's all been set up already. Which, I, which, by the way, I think is the future. And I actually saw it in action at the uh, Bard College High School in Bard. Baltimore. Yeah, absolutely. And I just think it's the most amazing thing. Well, Bard, we work specifically to recruit out of New York with the governor. Um, and MSDE had to do some additional work on teacher certification to bring in the professors and allow them to teach in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of new things that are happening in the last three years, which is significant in higher education because innovation is something we need to be doing. We have to quicken the pace of change to mirror what's going on you know, in, in the economy. So when the students graduate uh, from high school, they have the two-year associates, they ha with BARD anyway, they have the, uh, their, their high school diploma, and it's all, all, almost automatic admission into Bard College if they want to go to Bard College right? Uh, with only two years in college then leading to right. the bachelor's, which is amazing. Yeah, well, Bard is, is unique in terms of coming to do that as an individual college, but we also have that with a P-TECH program, which has to do with path, pathways and technology early college high school. So we have eight of those already established. Legislation was passed two years ago. Baltimore City and Prince George's were the first two county. And what this does, it's very unique. We bring together government, education, and business. Typically, they're siloed. But what we do is when we say we, it's multi-department under Governor Hogan's leadership to actually find those corporations that want to make a commitment for mentorship, internships, summer programs, and pay for the students to sign up similar to the Bard College. Mm -hmm. So two years high school, two years associate, and a, and a degree, and then on to college. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? Well, it, the world is changing so fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when we went to school, well, at least when I went to school, it was chalkboards and chalk, and cleaning the erasers and cleaning the boards and, and all those things. Then it was replaced by computers, personal computers. Mm -hmm. That's long gone. Yep. It's handhelds. New world. New world. Great and it's, new world. it's changing so quickly that those that start college now will be in a totally different career by the time they graduate. Yep. As you know, you buy an iPhone, a month later you've got a new one. All right, let's take another short break. We'll be right back on the 1430 Connection. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole in the studio with me today is the Secretary of the Maryland Higher Education Commission, Dr. James Fielder and Stephanie Sutherland. She's the Associate Director for the Office of Student Financial Assistance at the Maryland Higher Education Commission. How many members are there on the Higher Education Commission? 12. We haven't talked about one topic that I'm extremely interested in because it seems to be a choice that some could make and maybe have already made the ACM, the Academic Common Market. Tell me what the Academic Common Market is. The Academic Common Market is associated with, with the Southern Regional Education Board, which is a compact of 17 states in the southeast region of the United States that got together 25 years plus ago to make the decision that to provide higher education, academic, college careers, pathways to students from another state when that state didn't offer a degree. As an example, veterinary medicine. You know, a high cost, unique program that is in one state as a specialty, unique, very good, that the other state doesn't choose for whatever reason, either the number of students or desire, and the student is allowed to go out of state and pay in-state tuition. So Blacksburg being, is it Blacksburg, Virginia? Yeah. Is that where it is? Yeah. Um, but the, the estates are Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia. Um, 
and again, in-state tuition is available at schools in those states if the course of study is not available in Maryland. Sarah, what is Sarah? The State Authorization Reciprocity Act, which was um, passed by the Maryland legislature in 2015 fiscal year. This has to do with the compact of 49 states. Every state except California has agreed to this authorization to allow online education in other states. Mm -hmm. And for the state of Maryland, our universities and colleges apply to MHEC, our, our commission, to make sure that they are qualified, qualified financially at scholastic level. They have the IT resources, they have the library resources to broadcast. And then once they're, they're a member and approved, then they join the other 49 states and can send online education everywhere. All right, what am I missing that you would like to convey that is important for students today to know whether going into undergrad or graduate about the Maryland Higher Education Commission? The first thing is it's, it's about moving through college at the swiftest rate possible, you know, maintain a good grade point average and stay full time. It's once you accumulate that debt, there are new programs established in the last two years that has to do with tax credit. It's available last year was five million, this year is nine million, so we're processing applications as of today. So if you accumulated more than $20,000 in debt, and you currently have more than $5,000 debt, you go to our um, website. You can either go to mhec uh, at maryland.gov or the second one is Smart Save, which is mhec.maryland.gov. Click on Smart Save logo and then it drops you into scholarships and tax credit programs. So as soon as a kid has put in their application through the federal system, it goes through to your system and should somebody expect a call from you? We will notify students um, should we receive their FAFSA. Mm -hmm. um, we will actually automatically send them an email and say, hey, we're MHEC. This is what we do. We offer a number of states grant and scholarships that you might qualify for. And just informing them, you know, just in general of the various opportunities that might be available to them. We are also um, looking at developing um, an outreach specifically for students that qualify for in-state tuition. So we're covering kind of both bases um, where we are looking at, um, you know, various upcoming programs that might be available to those students as well. Um, so we're trying to catch students on both accords okay. that are, you know, Maryland residents specifically and letting them know of our various state grant scholarship opportunities. We have a lot of uh, military personnel in mm -hmm. Anne Arundel County. I am a veteran. Are, does that do when students fill out the facts for application? Is there a question on there as your parent? Uh -huh. There is a question on the FAFSA asking um, whether or not um, you or your parents served in the military. Mm -hmm. um, we specifically have state, a couple uh, off the top of my head, state grant and scholarships available specifically um, to our uh, military students and or their parents or spouses. Um, one in particular is the Veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq Conflict Scholarship mm -hmm. um, that's available to um, any student or if the student is parent or spouse um, served in Iraq or Afghanistan, um, that program is available to both undergraduate and graduate students. So there are a number of programs specific to military students. Super. Um, Dr. Fielder, you have anything to add? Um, just a couple things. Yeah. It, it's, it's really an exciting time in Maryland higher education. The level of innovation and experimentation and a little bit of risk taking is excellent. The institutions are doing joint appointments of of um, different disciplines. So you start to see biology blended in with pharmacology. You're starting to see the biotechnology blended in with the biometrics. So there's a lot going on that leads to new degrees, new programs, and new outreach. At the same time, the students need to be aware to pay attention to any of the deadlines uh, that are connected with scholarships. There's 13 people receiving and reviewing over 150,000 applications applications per year. So there's something when you say be patient, but pay attention to the deadlines and the text messages and emails that we broadcast out on a regular basis. That's where the helicopter parent comes in helpful, huh? Uh, yeah, we have <laughs> some parents that I've talked to personally where they got upset that their student, their daughter, son didn't answer an email because their parent told them not to. 
because they didn't recognize the sender. Yeah. So we deal with some of those kinds of issues, too. So it's it's personal attention that we can do, but at the same time, it's the you want to call it the helicopter parent i would call it the, the attentive parent, parent. And the concerned that doesn't want them living in the basement in two years <laughs> or four years thank you both very much for joining me today thank you thank you this is donna cole on the 1430 connection we will see you next week